Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and those calling from more eastern part of the world's good night. Welcome to our lounge event for the first set of standards by ISO Project Committee 317 on privacy by design for consumer goods and services. We're very happy to see such large interest in our work today. My name is Jan Schalabuk. I'm a privacy lawyer based in Berlin who previously worked at a data protection agency. I've been involved with developing privacy standards for more than 15 years now. And I have the honor of chairing this project committee 317 on privacy by design for consumer goods and services. It's been an absolute pleasure to chair this committee. I found the work attracted a very knowledgeable international community of experts yielding very many interesting discussions and I'm uh, looking forward to presenting some of the results of the work today. Some of those experts who were involved with developing this standard are here today to give you an overview and some insights into the set of standards that we have developed. We will start with Dr. Anke Lukian, whom most of you will already know. I will then invite Pete to the stage for a quick chat on how this work in ISO came about. Michelle, our project leader for ISO 317.00 part one, will then take a quick but deep dive into the set of high level requirements the committee came up with. Her talk will then be followed by a presentation on the second part of the standard, a technical report with use cases, which will give you an, an idea of how the standard can be applied. Finally, hopefully there'll be some 20 to 30 minutes of time for a quick Q&A. As I said, Anne may not need much of an introduction. Anne has been the Information and Privacy Commissioner of Ontario from 97 to 2014. She was the one that coined the term privacy by design following joint work with the Dutch DPA, especially with John Borking, if I remember correctly. I had the pleasure of occasionally being at conferences and workshops with her and John when I was still starting out in the field, I was very impressed with their foresight and I found their interdisciplinary approach very encouraging. And um, this was very much aligned with my thinking and I'm very honored that Anne volunteered to working with our committee on developing this international standard as I'm honored to have her here today to give us some introductory remarks. Anne, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, John. I am so delighted to be here today on this amazing occasion because it has been a long time coming, I assure you. Uh, as Jen mentioned, I was first appointed Privacy Commissioner in 1997 for three terms, uh, but that was a long time ago. And the first thing I noticed when I became commissioner was the, the brilliant lawyers who were in the office at the commission. But you see, I'm not a lawyer, I'm a psychologist. I studied psychology and my, law, but, but my PhD is in psychology. So I, took, I brought a different mindset. I wanted to create not just a system where you apply the laws after the privacy harms or data breach have happened, which is very important, but I wanted a proactive means of ideally preventing the privacy harms from arising up front. So I literally created Privacy by Design at my kitchen table over three nights in my first year's commission in 97. And then I took it in the office and I sold it, if you will, to the lawyers. It, it took a while, but they bought into it because I wasn't saying privacy laws aren't important. They're very important. But I wanted to minimize the need for them by ideally preventing the privacy harms from arising. And I had great, great luck, great success. Privacy by Design um, was unanimously passed as an international standard in 2010 by the International Assembly of Privacy Commissioners and Data Protection Authorities, which was in itself unique because most of these commissioners are brilliant lawyers, lawyers. So I, I spoke to them afterwards to thank them. And I said, I'm surprised everyone voted in favor of this. And they said, Anne, it's clear why we did this. The privacy harms, think of an iceberg. The privacy harms are only, the privacy laws are only reaching the tip of the iceberg. The base of the iceberg goes largely unknown, unchallenged, unaddressed. We can't have that. Hopefully your privacy by design will minimize the base as well. So we've had great luck. It's been translated into 40 languages. In 2018, I was thrilled. The new GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation included privacy by design and privacy as the default 
setting, which is the second of the seven foundational principles of privacy by design. And this was huge because everyone all around the world wants to be in conformance with the GDPR. They want to do business with the EU, et cetera. So it grew dramatically. And new laws that are just coming out, new privacy laws, like the law in Brazil last year, they got privacy by design in it. And they always call upon me to speak to them. Now, this becoming an ISO standard is the next leg up, which is absolutely magnificent. And I want to thank Michelle Chiba, my amazing director who worked with me when I was privacy commissioner, director of privacy and research. And, and she was amazing. And she has worked solidly on making privacy by design into an ISO standard. And I, I thank her so much. And I just want to make one thing clear about privacy by design. It's not an either or model. It's not privacy versus data utility or privacy versus security or versus anything. It's positive sum, not zero sum. Get rid of the data zero sum mindset. That's so, so yesterday. Embrace positive sum privacy and because that way you get the largest benefits and Companies that have embraced this have come back to me and they've said, we've gained a competitive advantage because it has grown trust where trust is lagging so much these days in privacy. There is virtually limited trust and this is a means of getting trust back as well as giving you business opportunities that will expand. So I wanna stop now because I don't wanna take up too much of your time, but it is in your best interest to consider doing this. Look at the ISO standard. You're going to love it, and this will increase the benefit, the offering of your company uh, to your customers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne. Very inspiring. like that very much. Um, Pete is a consumer standards and safety expert with a long history as a member of the British Standards Institute. He's joining our group as an expert from ANIG, a nonprofit to set up and ensure consumer voice in the standardization. Pete saw the need for consumer-oriented standardization in privacy, and I certainly do not exaggerate if I say if it was not for Pete, PC317 would have never come into existence. Pete, can you tell us on how you went about how you initiated this work? Yeah, thank you very much, Jan, and uh, all the times of the day, uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, may I have the next slide? I think that will help. Uh, it really kicked off as a result of me presenting some uh, privacy guides that have been created for ANEC for European consumer reps and in conversation with the ISO uh, Committee for Consumer Policy, uh, there was a general agreement that we didn't feel what we were seeing was uh, meeting things from the consumer perspective. Uh, I'd like to just talk about that very key uh line on the right hand side about our products are the front line of consumer protection for us now this is a hard one lesson from decades of product safety standards um, consumer products are purchased or licensed for personal household use in fact you'll find many terms and conditions actually exclude commercial organizational use uh, if we go to the left hand side, which is where there is a, an awful lot of great work in ISO, I mean, there isn't time to play due credit to all the work that's gone in there, but organisations are, well, they're organised. <laughs> they have processes, <laughs> procedures, systems, knowledge and skills. These are all things that consumers don't have. Um, and perhaps the most important thing about the sort of standards you see on the left hand side are that organizations have control over their operations well when you sit in the consumer perspective um, organizations don't have direct control over the purposes that consumers put their products to or the way that they use them uh, the only protection that we have as consumers is the functionality that's embodied in the hardware and software of our products so that's why I've included the front line of consumer protection. Mm -hmm. I think I've also started to indicate why it is that when we undertook a gap analysis, and it did take an awful lot of 2016, there's an awful lot of detail behind it. Um, it the gap was clearly dealing with this whole family, household, 
personal processing context. So I understand that you um, tried to convince Isa to commit to this journey um, and you went through Kapalko, if I remember correctly, that's, that's right. ISA Committee in Consumer Policy, and you went pretty much a standard route, pun, pun intended, when doing that, <laughs> producing a gap analysis, which is how we usually approach new fields of standardization, right? So there yep. is a huge document with uh, some, what was it, 20 something gaps that you had identified, right? Uh, that's in one area, and there are a lot of surrounding contextual things from consumer products as well, yes. Yeah, I remember that very well. When we started out, we saw this huge list that was going, whoa, okay. But <laughs> Pete, you can be serious of putting all of this into one standard, which then led to us just doing a, a high-level standard for this time being around, right? Uh, yeah. But uh, I was so impressed when when we saw that list, and it certainly gives us a vision of what is all ahead. Um, now, starting with this gap analysis, um, what came after that? How did you then um, go on in, in developing the standard or even approaching a new committee in that field? Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, could I have the next slide? Because the next step in the ISO process for uh, the Consumer Policy Committee, uh, they don't, they're not actually a technical committee, but they are allowed to uh, raise the need for new standards and that causes ISO to set up a project committee which is how we've worked under Jan's chairmanship. Um, we basically had to submit a new work item proposal and even that took a lot of work. Again, quite a lot of 2017 went into this. Uh, to try and give you a feel for what we were talking about, I've used the actual title of the standard to take you through. So the first word is consumer. I hope you see from the gap analysis that it needed to be fundamentally consumer centric. It's about protection, you know, what are we protecting? We're protecting consumer privacy. And what's the way in which we're providing that protection? Well, it's by the design of our goods and services. You know, we have good practice for the way that uh, organizations develop, launch, and then look after uh, the goods and services that we have in our hands, because as I say, that is the only tool we have available to us as individuals in our private lives to protect our privacy. So that was the scene that was set and a lot of, again, if you'll excuse the phrase, standard contents of a new work item proposal had to be produced um, to, to back that up and it had to go to the ISO Technical Management Board for approval uh, and get uh, Key nas enough national bodies saying that they supported it for the uh, Consumer Policy Committee's proposal to be accepted and the project committee set up. Uh, thank you very Is that much. a good enough overview, do you think, Jan? Yeah, I think that gave a very good idea of how, how much work went to into getting this started. Thank you very much for your contribution today, but also for your commitment to making this work happen. Everybody who has worked in standards knows that the quality um, of a standard is a result of, uh, is, is depending very much on a good editor. And a good editor we certainly found in Michelle. I'm very grateful that uh, Michelle had volunteered to take on the gargantum task of developing the standard. I have to say it's been an absolute pleasure to work with you, Michelle, not only because you brought enormous expertise to the topic, but also because you worked so tirelessly and diligently on evolving this document from its first working drafts through the committee drafts and through the subsequent stage stages all the way to the final published standard that we're seeing now. Just for you as an audience to get an idea of the enormous effort that went into that, Michelle led this document over the course of 48 months. The group met some seven times to resolve comments. Often there were several hundreds of them spread across similar amounts of pages. And it was Michelle's task to then direct the group to find consensus on these often slightly controversial topics to say the least. Michelle, um, I'm very happy that you're ready to present your work. I think you can very be very proud of it. Um, and um, given this is the most important of our, part of our event, we've scheduled 10 minutes for you now. Um, Michelle, the stage is yours. Thank you, Jan, and thank you, Anne, for your, you know, continued confidence in uh, 
me success, successfully delivering uh, the expectations. And thank you, on, Jan, for those kind words as well. And um, you're, you're right. Um, uh, this was my first volunteer activity in the ISO world. And um, believe me, I, I, I had I known <laughs> what it was, I may have had <laughs> second thoughts. But nonetheless, you know, working with, uh, again, you know, I'm repeating what Jan said, working with uh, such a, 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 a number of subject matter experts, and I'm going to speak to that, uh, was just uh, eye-opening and such a valuable experience that um, I would encourage anyone, you know, thinking of doing this um, to, to really jumping in and, and taking uh, an opportunity and a challenge such as this one. So um, just, just uh, I'd like to start uh, by way of background, and Jan alluded to this, um, and I'd just like to re-emphasize, um, while the project editor's role is important, you know, more as the steerer of, of ensuring that we get our job done, um, it's important to reflect, much like the audience we have here today, is that the PC317, the committee, it, it comprised of international um, national bodies, representatives from national bodies from all around the world with different languages, with different viewpoints of what privacy by design is about and how they may or may not be implementing it. And that was significant. Not only that, we had a number of subject matter experts, including representatives from both IT and non-IT disciplines. And as Jan said, that multidisciplinary approach to um, developing the standard is significant and it really does reflect privacy by design. So for example, um, you can see we had membership from other ISO committees, um, especially those responsible for the 27,000 series of IT security standards. And more importantly, uh, we had representation from consumer groups such as ANIC and Consumers International, uh, not to mention um, those representatives from ISO Capulco, as you heard from Pete just before me. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a peek into sort of the process um, of the committee and how we got here today. So when we started our work, we knew, you know, it was a four year journey. We, we had our timeline set and we knew that we needed some guidance to help really maintain the focus. Because sometimes in these committees, you have to go really deep into the woods, into the forest. And sometimes you have to come up for a little bit of breathing air just to make sure you know, that we're on the right track. So to help us maintain our focus and ensure that we, we kept our vision clear during you know, these several years of many different working drafts, um, we established these criteria to help us guide our journey. So the first one was we always wanted to remind ourselves that this is a global standard and that we really needed to lay out, you know, and be a starting point for those who may not know about privacy by design. And secondly, we didn't want to get too into the weeds of, you know, the how to's. We didn't want to be too prescriptive. We wanted the opportunity um, for those applying this standard to have some flexibility and, uh, you know, to, to enable innovation. Um, we also, as I said, uh, we wanted to ensure that the way in which we wrote it, the language that we used, could be understood by those who were not experts. But more than that, we were putting it constantly through a plain language filter because we knew that this could potentially be translated in, into many different languages. And we wanted to ensure that there was some purity in the interpretation of the words that we were using. And then finally, we wanted to write it such that, you know, we talked about it being high level. We wanted to write these requirements in a clear manner such that they could be repeatable and reproducible. 
And then lastly, we honestly, um, we acknowledge that some of the larger companies, you know, they've got robust privacy programs, they've got, you know, fairly um, inclusive um, IT departments, um, but we wanted here to really help and understand and take privacy by design through the lens of these small and medium sized enterprises, because we realized that that was an area perhaps that needed more help. So when we started our work, um, we were provided uh, a fairly broad scope statement by what we call sort of the management board, it's called TMB of ISO. Um, and that was to help us begin the project. But as we were going through our deliberations, uh, we felt it was a bit too broad for the timeline that we were given to deliver a standard. And so we spent a significant amount of the front end part of our discussions to refine and further clarify the scope statement that appears in clause two of the standard. And as you can see, and again, um, as Jan introduced, this is a standard um, that establishes very high level requirements for privacy by design. And we take you know, it throughout the life cycle of the consumer product. And it, in fact, we include um, the concept of even domestic data processing, right? Household. Um, and we wanted to, limit the scope right and as well identify what what the standard doesn't do it doesn't do uh, provide requirements for these privacy assurance and commitments it doesn't delve deep into that nor do we did we want to constrain it again as part of our criteria that i mentioned earlier we didn't want to constrain it to a particular methodology we realized that these methodologies are are evolving and that organizations need to be creative and adopt it and customize it to their own culture. And then we also didn't want to constrain it with respect to uh, the technology. We really wanted it to be neutral in that particular area. So clause three of the standard or of any standard um, is reserved for terms and definitions. Um, but what I'd like to point out here in terms of our committee work is, you know, oftentimes, you know, we were being, you know, encouraged, okay, let's, let's get to some terms, let's, let's start defining, defining our terms, but honestly, we really got into the terms and definitions sort of midway after we all level set and uh, were kind of rowing in, in the same direction, we understood what we wanted in the standard, you know, the working draft was coming to shape. We were all, you know, kind of agreeing and, and having a, a common understanding of where we wanted to get to. But what I'd like to point out here is that our work not only developed new terms and definitions, for example, privacy by design, but more significantly, we took a lot of the existing ISO standards and, you know, sort of reshape them to fit um, this new paradigm, which is the consumer perspective. So for example, we did uh, reshape the consumer definition that is often in many of the ISO standards. Mm -hmm. And what you can do is I've provided a link here, and this link will give you a very good, you know, the, the, the full list of the terms that we used for this standard. So in our introduction, we knew that it would be publicly available. And we knew that we wanted to set it, the, the introduction to set the stone, uh, the, the, the tone and the structure for, for the standard. And so it was important for committee members and the working group members to include the outcomes and the value of taking a privacy by design approach. So here are the three guiding principles or themes um, that are a result of, of that significant discussion. And you can see 
um, that they represent uh, what members agreed uh, as the essence of privacy by design, and that these should be reflected in the totality of the requirements. So you have, you know, in empowerment, empowerment of the consumer, um, transparency um, in terms of, and you'll see later on when I talk about the clauses, uh, institutionalization, that's really making privacy part of the DNA, part of the culture, you know, making it systematized. And then there's a sense of responsibility and not just responsibility of the organization, but we speak to and call out the responsibility of the individual as well. And then we couldn't forget the fact that, you know, we're dealing with integrated systems and a huge ecosystem, and you can't just cut off privacy, you know, around one sort of sandbox, that we really do need to have this larger sort of overarching view of what's going on, not to mention, you know, of course, the full life cycle. Right? You can't forget that. So generally speaking, there are eight clauses in, in our standard and five of which um, include uh, the requirements. So what you'll find in clause four, and again, it, it reflects having this as the first clause really reflects uh, the consumer focus or the individual focus, because in this you will find requirements around, you know, ensuring that you address first and foremost the privacy rights of individuals and translating that into uh, con direct controls. Included in this general section um, are also um, management, sort of ma organizational management type um, requirements. And they have, we have put uh, a focus on the consumer perspective for those particular privacy management aspects. The next clause, which is clause five, uh, goes to the importance of consumer communication. And we all know that this is an important area, whether it's user interface, we speak to human interface design, but we get into those particular aspects. And all of these, remember the, the sort of guiding themes and principles, these really do support transparency and then accountability reorganization. Clause six, we couldn't forget um, the importance of privacy risk management as an approach and the value that this approach takes to proactively and effectively manage and mitigate privacy risks. That's what we're all about here. Um, because we really do want to reduce or try to at least reduce uh, consumer exposure to any adverse con uh, consequences. And that's what uh, Dr. Kavukian mentioned in her opening talk, um, the importance of trying to prevent a breach uh, to the degree possible. In clause seven, we really did here borrow from IT service management. You know, when you're starting to develop, deploy and operate uh, these designed privacy controls. And we are also getting into uh, systems engineering. We had a number of experts who were in the systems engineering area. And this definitely helped us to better understand. And these are from an ecosystem and life cycle lens. Finally, in clause eight, we highlight um, the need to pay attention to the end of the PII life cycle. This was one um, that was included in a lot of Dr. Kabukian's work. It was the end to end you know, security, right? We often forget about the end of the PII because it could be years before that happens. So this was an important uh, piece of the standard. The committee wanted to format the requirements to include not just the clause title and the requirement. We could have we could have done that, and in many of the other standards, you see that. But those are standards where the discipline is 
quite mature and everybody has an understanding of sort of the principles and the, the uh, particular themes and the terms, for example. But being sort of the first ISO standard on privacy by design, we did want to provide a little bit more robust explanation to help those who may not be familiar with privacy by design. And then of course, guidance that would definitely add further clarity. And we really wanted to reduce any ambiguity in understanding the, the requirement and um, the particular actions to be taken. So I'm going to show you as my final slide, um, an example clause. So this is clause eight and clause eight, the subject is uh, really the end of the PII life cycle. So that's the, 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 the subject of the final clause eight. And one of the requirements is with respect to, you know, the third party. So we actually documented, and this is a shall statement. So this is the rule, it's the shall statement. Then we go into an explanation, which, which should help um, to better understand the intent of this particular requirement. And then finally, we go to the guidance, which are should statements. And these should statements and this particular section with respect to guidance, we do provide a significant number of references and you can find those in the bibliography. Antonio is current CEO of Trialog. It's an independent company based in Paris developing information systems. He has a master's degree from Harvard University and an engineering degree from Ecole Centrale Paris. I'm very pleased to have you here, Antonio. Um, Antonio always impresses me with his efficiency and uh, through his efficiency, we were able to complement the uh, part one that Michelle just spoke about with a part two, which is a technical report to provide additional um, information and uh, help understand how to apply ISO 317.00 in practice. Antonio, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to provide an overview of part two of the ISO 31700. This is a technical report, uh, which is uh, providing use cases on part one. Okay. Um, part two is providing uh, illustrative use cases, and the objective is to help understand the requirements of ISO 31700 part one. Okay. So on the left, you can see the structure of part one, which is uh, categorized into five types of requirements, general requirements, consumer communication requirements, risk management requirements, development, deployment, and operation of design, privacy controls, and end of PII lifecycle requirements. Um, if we zoom into risk management requirements, we can see five uh, uh, requirements high level requirements, conduct a privacy risk assessment, assess privacy capabilities of third parties, establish and document requirements for privacy control, monitor and update risk assessment, include privacy risk in cybersecurity reasons design. So uh, we have selected the three representative use cases. There are examples, there are many others obviously, okay? So the first is on retailing. Uh, People use laptop, tablets, smartphone to buy things on the internet, okay? This is a mainstream, maybe the first mainstream application with a, a social networks perhaps, okay? The second is about a fitness center. So where you practice at physical activities externally. And the, the interesting thing about this use case is it involves two organizations. One, which is the fitness center, and the other one is the organization that is providing a smart health application, okay? So an interesting uh, case to handle, okay? And the third one is on smart locks. And uh, uh, this is highlighting the product line approach, which many companies have to make to, 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 to achieve their business, okay? And here we identify three configurations, basic use, co-location use, and family use. And you can see right away that for each configuration, you have different privacy concerns, okay? So this is a very interesting use case because you might have actually three designs to do, okay? In particular, for the family use case, uh, you have to track maybe your children. 
So uh, the way we did uh, uh, the, uh, the, the description, we're using what we call the use case structure. This is of course following some uh, ISO standards, okay? And uh, uh, each use case is uh, structured into six parts. One, which is an overall description, and the rest are zooming into each category of requirement. Okay. So for each part, we have a narrative and some diagram to express uh, what's uh, to, to illustrate the, the narrative. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give you one example, which is uh, the uh, online retailing uh, use case. And uh, so this is the diagram for uh, the use case description. So you see, uh, you have on the left in orange, uh, the consumer part. So we have the consumer placing the order and he uses a laptop, a tablet or a smartphone, okay? And it happens that in this story, he goes online and find toys for the grandchildren. So you bet this is the grandfather, okay? Or the grandmother, okay? And on the right, uh, you have uh, the organization part. So the retailer, which might have a deal with the payment system, okay? So a sequence diagram is actually showing the sequence of actions that are taking place. Uh, I'm buying and then I'm placing the order. Uh, I provide contact information because we need this in order to, to, uh, uh, to execute the, the order. Then the product, uh, credit card information is provided, uh, payment happens. Uh, the retailer might ask, do you want to create a, 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 an account? Uh, in this case, we say no, so uh, we make a note that uh, uh, the customer doesn't want to have an account and we proceed, okay? So this is really a picture that is describing uh, the use case, okay? So uh, second is more interesting with respect to uh, the high level requirements of ISO 31700 uh, here. So we are uh, focusing on the sequence diagram for risk management, okay? So again, uh, we see in the middle, the purchase session, where uh, the grandfather went online to buy uh, the toys, okay? But preliminary to this, the company uh, started to do his design, okay? And he has a phase called consumer service privacy risk analysis, where he uh, will analyze the privacy risk associated with the service, the requirements for consumer support, the requirements for the protection of the data that you, you might have collected, an assessment of supplier that are providing the data storage protection, okay? So all those things are the natural things we will do. And we structure this in ISO 31700-1 through those three requirements. Conduct a privacy risk assessment, establish and document requirements for privacy controls, assess privacy capabilities of third parties, okay? So this is really illustrative and shows right away to the designer that uh, this phase is important and this is actually documented by those high level requirements, okay? So then he does, uh, he can proceed to uh, operate uh, the uh, service and you can see that during operation, we have other things that happen, okay? So what you call periodic privacy risk assessment where the company will evaluate whether some cybersecurity news uh, could have an impact on the data storage protection, or to evaluate whether uh, the consumer support program is good enough. And this corresponds to uh, yet another requirement, which is monitor and update risk assessment. I hope that by, by this example, you have seen that we try to be as uh, uh, illustrative as possible to help uh, people uh, implement uh, the uh, standard properly. And this is ending my talk. Hello, everyone. My name is Brad Gold, and I'm vice chair of the Canadian delegation, as well as co-convener of the communications group for PC317. We really appreciate all of you being here today, as well as all of the questions that we received prior to the event and during the event uh, in the chat here. So we are going to pose a few of these questions to our panelists and get to as many of them as we can in the limited time that we have. So the first question uh, that I wanna to pose to our panelists is, uh, who is the audience for this document? This is a consumer protection document, but it looks like we're also talking about and talking to organizations. So uh, perhaps Michelle, uh, you may wish to take this, and if other panelists want to weigh in as well, you're welcome to do so. We, we struggled uh, with this particular aspect within the committee because, um, again, um, as I mentioned, we had 
representation from a broad swath of disciplines within an organization and the consumer representation as well. And then we looked at, you know, who, who do we really want within an organization um, to really understand this? And honestly, um, you can see uh, we put uh, the full range um, and it was difficult for us to actually cut the list off because if we could have said everybody should be reading this, even consumers, we would have we would have put that in. But instead, what we did was we said, really, you know, it, it's for staff of organizations, but not just for the organization, but really for their third parties right? Um, who are responsible for the concept. Of course, that's what we want to do. We want to start as early as possible. Uh, for the design, you know, that stage, and then for even the manufacturing and management. And we even included testing, operation, service maintenance, and disposable of consumer goods and services. So I think we put the full life cycle of staff or individuals who might be involved in that, in that, in those particular um, stages of a, a product, right? Um, so essentially, Brad, we, we want we want the world to read this, this standard and to understand uh, it. And we've also realized that, you know, while we understand that this is a, an ISO standard, you know, for um, organizations, uh, we felt that it was also important to write it in such a way that if consumers wanted to, they could read it and really understand um, what, their, what their rights are and what they could expect of organizations who are, you know, whose products and services they're purchasing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Brad, if I, if I could add, think broadly. You have to think of this as expanding and applying to as many organizations, companies, et cetera, that are interested in protecting their customers' privacy. Because surveillance is mounting at a steady pace. We need to engage corporations, companies, organizations, individuals, in terms of the benefits of proactively protecting your customer's information and gaining the benefits, gaining a competitive advantage. We have to frame this in a positive way. This is what customers deserve. May, may I make a quick comment, Brad? Um, Go right ahead. Having spent a lot of my career before I retired as a product manager, we use the concept of a product team, which I recognize and worked with a lot. Um, there are many potential people, but there's a core around the people who are actually responsible for the product. And what we've got aligns extremely well with known product management good practice. I've seen some comments about the other areas that relate to organizations, internal systems and things. I've tried to paint a picture of you're in a different context. It is a different world when you're dealing with consumer products. Uh, and we need to be very careful and People need to call in those standards and those uh, principles that apply in the organizations, systems and processes um, when it's appropriate. We have products out there and the smart locks is one example where the consumer has choice and makes this choice quite often where there is no organizational processing at all. All the software is run on consumer equipment. So, you know, I would just say, let's be cautious. This is a really important standard to learn, absorb, it sets the scene. It will do much to get your, uh, your thinking in line with what we need as consumers. Thank you. Right, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, a, a question that I see coming up all the time is uh, how this document actually relates to, to the plethora of other standards that are out there in ISO that might be related. And uh, I wondered if there's any takers in our panel who, who could give us some purview on this. So this standard is very much life cycle oriented. Is uh, I'm talking because I'm an engineer. We mentioned we also have to mention that this is also meant to be read by the engineers. And the good, what we have achieved is it's operational for the engineers. It's also operational for uh, the policymakers. They read the standard, they understand the value. 
and the engineers, they read the standard, they understand how to implement it. That's very important. And uh, I would say this is the first one which does it completely from uh, cradle to grave, I mean, that's uh, actually, and uh, it relates to the other uh, privacy engineering uh, methodologies, all of them, which are sometimes more specific, more detailed. Some people mentioned uh, PI deletion, it's consistent. So uh, he, this standard is high level, and the others, they, they sometimes get to the nitty gritty detail. And we have been very careful to achieve that, hopefully. Yeah, I think that cannot be overemphasized in a way. I mean, keep in mind, when we approach this, we said, okay, there is so many details that we could look, look into, but when you start out into a new field, you really have to first have agreement on those high level elements. And that's what's been done. And um, some of the implementers may be uh, a, a bit disappointed because it doesn't give that detailed um, information or requirements for specific questions. However, in those cases where there already were standards available for those details, they would usually be would usually be referenced in the standard, um, so that could be filled out exactly like Antonio said. Um, Brad, next question. Yes. Um, well, we've received a, a number of questions, as you said, Yan, about how this standard relates to other standards, as well as uh, some of the other guidance documents and principles and other amazing research that is out there all over the world. So I'm wondering if any of the panelists could please speak to some of the influences that we had in creating this standard and how we ended up where we are today. Well, I think one aspect that should certainly be considered is the set of experts that participated in this. So we had a lot of influx and influence from people that have been working in standardization in SC27, especially in working group five, who's developing identity management and privacy technologies. So a lot of those standards were um, certainly considered, um, but we also had participants from uh, the spectrum of data protection agencies so um, things like the opinion of the EDPB, I think that was raised, were certainly on the at the table when, when drafting the standard. So I, I would hope that it's fairly consistent um, with, with what um, the EDPB uh, has exposed in their opinion. However, um, I wouldn't be 100% sure that all the requirements are fully reflected from the EDPB. That's uh, still to be seen, and we're very much looking forward to to hear from practitioners in that. Mm. If, I, if I could mention uh, the relationship to the GDPR, and th this isn't just my view, I'm gonna read you a very, very short quote that was published in Information Age um, when they, they talked about this and they said, developed by former Information Privacy Commissioner and Kavukian Privacy by Design has had a large influence on security experts policy makers, markers, and regulators. The EU likes privacy by design. It's referenced heavily in Article 25 and in many other places in the new regulation. It's not too much of a stretch to say that if you implement privacy by design, you've mastered the GDPR. And with due respect, there's much more than GDPR than privacy by design, I assure you. But I think the, the sentiment that is being reflected here is that if you follow privacy by design, it's such a high standard to begin with that you will end up automatically complying with a number of the other sections of the GDPR, which of course is huge because people globally want to ensure compliance with the GDPR. So I wanted to mention that reference. I think the, the broad answer for the audience here is that globally, we took into consideration as many different standards, laws, guidance documents, pieces of research, everything that we could get our hands on to try to deal with uh, the iceberg issue, as some of our other panelists have framed it. And so we've tried to be as comprehensive as possible, sometimes through very, very direct analyses, especially with respect to some of the other ISO standards, and other times simply taking inspiration from some of the other amazing work that's out there from the whole body of privacy professionals that's joining us on this ride. And Brad, I'd just like to add that uh, we had challenges again uh, with respect to limiting the bibliography. So I think um, whoever picks up the standard 
uh, will find the bibliography quite comprehensive and diverse in terms of the types of resources that the committee looked at um, and considered within the context of developing the standard. Maybe I should add that uh, my feeling is personal that there's no such thing as two different camps. Uh, when we work on this standard, we were only one camp. So I was working with NIST, I was using the European stuff, but I was also using the Asian stuff, the things coming from Anne, of course, from uh, America. And so we are uh, in the same camp, we try to achieve the same thing. And uh, this is uh, maybe the first uh, topic in which uh, I can say that we are in this situation. So let's take advantage of that. Hmm. May, may I make a quick comment, Brad? Um, we've taken something rather like the 9001 approach, which is you have to understand the context of your product and then determine what standards and regulation apply. <laughs> And that's part of establishing the requirements for development of the product. Absolutely. Now, Thank before you, everyone. We, we run out of time and we get to a closing, there's this one question that always pops up in these uh, fora is, uh, does, does ISO provide certification or testing to the standard? How does it relate to um, certification? So is there anybody wanting to take that up? Okay, I'll take a, a, a try, Jan. Um, one of the first things is always that, um, and, and this is a, a, an overarching ISO um, policy approach to standards that fundamentally they are voluntary for the first part. In terms of um, conformity, um, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, the intent was not that this be a conformance standard, but that doesn't mean by, by any um, stretch of the imagination that we, we didn't want this to become um, a, a measurable, reproducible um, effort. And we wanted to help the community to do this. It just wasn't gonna happen in this particular standard. Um, so we, we wrote the requirements with an effort and with a view to, to making them as such reproducible and measurable. Um, and my understanding of this marketplace is that it will be the market that will determine whether or not, you know, the, 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 the each jurisdiction will make decisions around how to use this particular standard. So stay tuned. I think we could probably give you a much um, more robust response, but given the time frame, and we do have a link within the um, actual standard, it, it, it is defined by ISO and there is a link with respect to uh, their protocol on conformity assessments, etc. So they do have a, um, a, a fairly rigid policy on that. Thank you. And if yeah, I could just leave a, a parting remark at a very high level, don't forget this. Privacy forms the foundation of our freedom. If you want free and open societies, we have to preserve our privacy at all costs, and this will help you to do so. Excellent. And those remarks really lead me into, into what should be a final question. It's, uh, so what's next, really? Um, and um, I'm going to take that question myself. Um, and I have to remind everybody that PC317 was established as a project committee. That means it was only put in place to deliver one project. We already delivered two. Um, usually it would be disbanded now, um, but we have already heard that there is much more work ahead. And therefore we are contemplating to ask ISO Technical Management Board uh, to establish a permanent TC. But there is a number of things to consider when permanently establishing a new field of work. Amongst them is the question where to best allocate the work. It might also be sensible to task already existing group with the work ahead, such as the working group five in SC27, because this group has been working on privacy technologies since 2006, and there's a lot of expertise there. But this discussion is ongoing. Uh, we hope to have a decision uh, in TMB uh, in the next couple of months. So by fall, the road ahead should be clear. We are already in discussions with CASCO, which is the group on conformity assessment. 
Um, there is today even a discussion with those experts from SC27 uh, on how to best look at the work. Um, but it's going to take a little bit. ISO processes are not famous for being very fast. In the meantime, um, we would um, like to send all of you a follow-up email with the slides, link to the recording, further information in a couple of weeks. We're also planning on having another webinar in early fall. If you're interested in getting involved and have not done so already, you could apply to your national body, i.e. that is the national member of ISO, such as BSI in the UK, or for me in Germany, it's the Deutsche Institut für Normung, um, uh, to become part of the mirror committee of ISO um, that works in, uh, for those committees that work on privacy. Um, this would allow you to comment on ongoing standards um, and even be delegated to the international meetings if you uh, like to do so. We're always looking for your expertise. As for the 317.00 part one itself, we're now, everybody now is looking forward to see practitioners applying the standard. Um, we want to learn from this and eventually we'll take that into account when it comes to a revision in a couple of years down the road. Um, with that being said, if you have not yet obtained a copy of the standard, um, BSI has provided a 10% discount um, with the code um, that's on screen. You may want to take a screenshot as it could take a couple of days until we uh, will be able to share the, the slides. Or of course, you can go to your national standards study directly. With that being said, um, we have to come to a finish for today. Um, I would like to thank you all for attending today's session. Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, I'm, I'm very excited to see so much interest and I'm also very happy to have seen so much input through the chat, which we will now further look into. We should all thank our speakers, Anne, Pete, Michelle, Antonio, as well as our communications group, uh, Brad and Ray, and of course, our committee manager, Jean, who has been tirelessly working to making this event happen. Thank you to all of you.